We now move on to uh, Rita Manchanda. I, I can't see Rita. Here she is. Uh, she's a writer, researcher, human rights activist, specializing in peace building across conflict contexts in South Asia. Well, I should have said prolific writer. She's not just a writer. She's prolific. And she was a, uh, she, ha she brings in 15 years of senior executive and research experience with the regional NGO South Asia Forum for Human Rights, where she directed and coordinated a diverse portfolio of programs, such as human rights audits of peace processes, women, conflict and peace, media in conflict and rights-based approaches to poverty reduction. Uh, she served as gender advisor to the Commonwealth Technical Fund and has consulted with UN Women, United Nations Development Program, Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, Safer World, you name it. And she's lectured extensively on conflict resolution across campuses in India and abroad and, as I said, published extensively. Uh, interestingly, Rita is also right now engaged in research on women in combat operations in the army, in peacekeeping, and so on. And she, I mean, I'm sure the results of her research are going to be extremely fascinating and an eye-opener. Huh. So, Rita, just a question. You you know, you work very, very sort of okay. closely with, with Afghan women. You have worked across regions of conflict. How do peace constituencies of women use their experience to inform the building of transnational solidarities, mm -hmm. uh, like your work in Afghanistan. And how are they connected to the denial of access to security and livelihoods, and of course, education? We're seeing a kind of what you call gender apartheid in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, so would you speak to that and what women peace builders can do? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be part of this process. Um, for, and I'm very happy to be speaking after Happy Mon has muddied the waters and has said and has said we need to tra transcend gender binaries. And perhaps I think many of us would be more comfortable in terms of displacing gender binaries. Uh, in you know, in terms of the unmaking of war, there is a book that says unmaking men, unmaking war. I think, and if you read it by Kathleen Barry, you will see what she's saying is unmaking masculinities, hyper-masculinities, and bringing in femininities for men and women. Uh, but let's leave that aside. Thank you so much for that intervention. Um, since we are looking at this whole, I the issue of the continuum of peace building, transnational peace building, uh, local peace building, provincial, I would like to, in fact, refocus on the regional dimension. Uh, because this, um, given the fact that South Asia is one of the least, at the level of the state, the least interconnected, that web of interconnection with SARC should have been, does not really, uh, is not an inspiring example at all. But nonetheless, if you look and I come from the civil society stream. If you look at the civil society level, there is a huge density of thickness in terms of interaction, of interconnectedness, of learning from each other. And just very recently, I want to um, mention that I'm also part of something called the Women's Regional Network uh, that works across conflicted borders of Afghanistan, Pakistan, India and Sri Lanka. And very, very recently, we had um, uh, a study um, based on, uh, we wanted to look at the impact of the return of the Taliban on Afghan women, both within Afghanistan, as well as the influx of masses of women fleeing gender persecution to Pakistan and to India. And uh, these studies were, in fact, released at the House of Lords on December 7th. Uh, and um, what is interesting about the studies is one that we still argue that what happens in Afghanistan, what happens in India, what happens in Pakistan affects all of us. The causes of conflict in these countries, the consequences of conflict within these countries have a regional impact. Their solutions also lie in a regional response. 
and in particular, women have been struggling against decades of negotiating internal conflicts and that these conversations, and we are not the only ones, the WRN or Women's Regional Network is just one initiative. WISCOM has itself been in the forefront of several such initiatives. Suffer the organization I was with has also been. So there are multiple, multiple such interventions that have been made in terms of sharing. But I want to just share, take, uh, share a nugget uh, from, in fact, a lot of the work that we did on this impact of the Taliban on Afghanistan. I'm sure many of you have read about it, but in terms of the India case, partly because we didn't have such an overload of refugees like uh, Afghan, uh, Pakistan, we were able to pull out patterns. And in the statistic, uh, in the quantitative survey that we did, we found that 25% of the women who have fled Afghanistan and are seeking asylum or have refugee status are single women. They came unaccompanied. And these are not elite women. The elite women have gone to Europe and the US. Uh, these are women who come from the provinces. These are first generation literates. These are women who really are, um, are actually not, uh, I mean, they're not from the um, urban, uh, as I said, urban elite. They are the provincial first generation literates who have struggled against all odds to actually get educated. And they've come on their own. Some of them are as young as 17, 18 years old. What it shows is that the impact of 20 years, yes, of foreign aided of um, Republican Afghanistan made a difference to the lives of these women. And these women now having tasted freedom, having tasted the possibility of some level of dreaming about an aspira uh, of aspirations, were not willing to stay. They fled. And they fled often secretively, often only with the help of perhaps their mother or sister. And they came to India. And these, of course, now they and enormous profiles of courage and resilience. So, uh, but leaving that uh, aside, what about in terms of trying to get traction on Afghanistan? I have to confess that while at one level we talk about the agency of women's collectives and we have some of the most powerful women's organizations in South Asia, in in fact the world, and yet it's very, very difficult to get women's collectives to engage on any issue that has a foreign policy or a national security dimension. They will engage, of course, they will engage on co communal conflicts. They will engage on step, uh, stopping, preventing, but they will not engage on, say, the Northeast. Um, they will not engage on Kashmir. They will rarely engage on, in fact, the Maoist conflict in the heartland of India. So it's also partly that, that you are really quite isolated. I mean, the Rohingya, the influx of Rohingya refugees, the massive... Um, genocidal type violence against the women of um, against the Rohingya women, the sexualized violence perpetrated against them should have um, in, uh, provoked some kind of um, uh, a feminist response from the region because it affects all of us, not only India, it affects Pakistan, it affects, um, as I said, the region as a whole. Yet it's impossible to get traction on this. So there are also these kind of challenges. But I want to also mention some best practices, some good stories to take away from. Just uh, not recently, but in 2014, women's collectives, and for once they did come together, um, in the CEDA review um, process, they, um, Indian women from various uh, women's collectives raised the whole issue of gender, the need for gender sensitivity in India's external development assistance. Um, the, point, uh, the example was uh, in Sri Lanka, India was building the, this huge housing complex and there were uh, allegations that the women were being asked to contribute 10%. And since these were very poor women, they had no resources at all, what could they trade except sex? So these were the issues, and it was raised by Indian women at the CEDAW um, review process uh, to hold the Indian government accountable. Um, but 
just uh, before I conclude, I just want to also mention that in the from the 1990s, 1980s, 1990s, and the millennium decade, uh, there was so much interaction, peace groups being brought from, uh, because we learned from Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka had a much more active history of, peace of women peace builders. We learned the politics of motherhood from them. We learned also the politics of mourn, the performance of mourning. These were all strategies that in fact we learned from them. And who were the agencies that enabled women to cross these borders? WISCOM helped in fact Naga women go to um, Sri Lanka to learn about best practices. My own organization was involved in several of these conversations. And um, I think that when we talk about the Naga Mothers Association, they picked up a lot of their strategies also from, in fact, the Sri Lankan women who were really the association of the parents of the disappeared. Yes, we were inspired by the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, but also from the Sri Lankan women who showed it could work in Sri Lanka. So there's been a lot of this on India, Pakistan, Wipsa had these, you know, took these bus journeys, uh, brought women from Pakistan to India in, and from India to Pakistan. There is the Pakistan India People's Forum for Peace and Democracy that has women, that has very strong women constituencies dialoguing. So, uh, I think it's extremely important to recognize that there is this density of civil society action. Unfortunately, a lot of that has now been constrained. I do not need to elaborate why. But I have to confess that support that one gets is from transnational women's networks. But very rarely do we get support, of course, from um, Indian diplomats or from, in fact, even the European diplomats. And I'm delighted that this process is taking place because I do hope that this will be the beginning for a much more um, active dialogue. And just to conclude, uh, Ambassador Gerard, you mentioned that you know people don't want to uh, take on these mentored uh, mediators because they have no experience. Surely the mediators that you identified, I mean, surely the people that you identified to mentor were people who had very rich grassroots experiences of mentoring. The women that I have worked with in the Northeast have years and years of building peace, of this stop all bloodshed, of frat, frat, stopping fratricidal violence, of using kitchen diplomacy to bring major leaders together. Uh, I mean, surely, I think it would be perhaps unfair to say that they, they are seen as lacking experience. It is, in fact, the same thing you said. Because <coughs> women are so reified in these gendered roles that they are not seen as capable of sitting on the geopolitical table because they don't know the language. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rita. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, just to share with you that Ambassador uh, Puri was in Sri Lanka for four years, mm -hmm. and he probably would bring you a lot of other insights as well. And thank you for sharing that, because uh, today many of these cross-border networks are, are using Zoom and the platforms that they, they would have to access, because sometimes visa difficulties prevent them from meeting, and Sapan is one of